Hey guys, I wanted to make this video today to talk about how to manage other people's perceptions of you. That is, how to deal with the way that other people think about you and how you can influence the way that other people think about you in a way that is favorable to you. I decided to make this video actually in answer to a question I got on my last video. My last vi video being about why I recommend moving away from the city to a more rural area, which I've just done and you can see behind me here. <laughs> I'm using this video as an excuse to, you know, be outside in the backyard because I like it here. But anyway, the question was from a gentleman who said that he would like to live in a rural area, to live in, in rural America specifically, but he's not sure if he wants to do that because he's afraid of racism. Because he is from Africa, he's black, and he's worried that he won't be received very well in the rural areas. And so I decided to use this opportunity to talk about how to manage other people's expectations of you in general, that, uh, that your expectations of people based on your race or based on your expectations of prejudice from other people are really part of a much broader picture about the way that we interact with those around us. And so this is something that everybody could learn from because it's always an open question about whether or not the people around us like us, or whether or not if we move to a new place or if we tr visit a new place, are the people going to accept us? Are they going to be friendly to us or are they going to be hostile to us? So in this video, I'm going to show you how you can deal with that. Okay, now the first point I want to make before we get into it, you know, addressing the question specifically about whether or not you're going to face racism. If you go to a rural area in the U.S. is that I think that stereotype is, is massively exaggerated by the media. That we have all these horror movies about people that move to the small town and they get brutally murdered and uh, we have all this propaganda of, of these crazy rednecks that are going around lynching people. I just don't think it's true. In my experience, I don't think that's true at all. I think this is uh, propaganda meant to put exactly the kind of fear that, that I, we're encountering in this question, to make people feel unwelcome so that they all pile into the cities and don't ever leave, right? Because the people in power want this. The people that control the propaganda machines, they want everybody together in the cities where they're under constant camera surveillance 24-7, where they're all, uh, you know, within easy range of their control mechanism. And in fact, you see this really blatantly in socialist countries where they do everything they can to put the small farmers out of business, right? They try to make it so that you are as economically dependent on being close to the city as they possibly can. So you either you live in the city or you starve. Those are your only two choices. And we're seeing that here in the U.S. as well, although we're not quite so advanced as some other countries. So the first thing to keep in mind is just don't believe the propaganda. Right? Go, go and test it for yourself. Experience it for yourself and see if what they've told you about living in the country, about living in a small town, see if that's actually true. I bet you'll be surprised. One of the things that the media is really, really good at is spreading lies directly into your unconscious. So they won't tell you exactly that everybody in the small towns are racist. They'll show you depictions of it, fictional depictions, right? In some cases, real depictions, right? And, you know, they'll ignore all of the good stuff and just focus on a few bad apples or a few bad cases and then repeat it over and over and over again so that gets drilled into your subconscious mind. And at the same time, they'll give you a whole bunch of fictional depictions of horrible things happening in these situations. And of course, if you actually go and look at the statistics, it's completely opposite, right? You're far more uh, safe when you're out in the country than you are in the city. But your subconscious mind doesn't really function like that. It just uh, functions according to what it has been shown. And, and the pictures and the dramatizations that we see on TV and in the movies are very powerful in influencing the subconscious mind. But the main point I want to go over in this video is about how people respond to you when you show up in somewhere that's new or even somewhere that's familiar for that matter. And the, the number one thing that determines how people respond to you, I guarantee you, is not your race, it's not your height, it's not your age, it's not your gender, it's not your fashion sense, it is the energy that you bring with you. And so the way that that normally manifests itself is that you get what you expect to get. So if you go into a new city or a new country or a new meeting and you expect everybody there to be hostile to you, you're going to get what you expect. Everybody will be hostile to you. If you go into a new place and you expect everybody to be friendly to you, chances are everybody's going to be friendly to you. 
It doesn't really matter what reasons you put behind that. It doesn't matter why you expect that, whether it's because of racism or you expect that you're going to be the odd man out because you're the youngest or you're the oldest or you're the fattest or you're the skinniest or, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter what the, the reason is that you tell yourself in your mind. What happens is that when you go into a room or you go into a town and you expect hostility, then you have a negative expectation, you have a negative energy, you project this energy of, of defensiveness and oftentimes outright hostility, right? Because if you're expecting somebody to be hostile to you, chances are you're going to act hostile at first. And then what's the person or what are the people around you going to respond to you? How, how are they going to respond to you? Well, chances are they're going to respond with hostility. Right? They're going to respond with negativity because they're getting that negative energy from you. And so you're going to go and then back rationalize that into your mind as confirmation of whatever you believe to begin with. Right? So if you believe that you go to a town and everybody's going to be racist and they're not going to like you because they're racist, then you're going to go there, you're going to be defensive, you're going to have defensive body language, you're going to have defensive vocal tonality, you're going to have defensive energy about you, uh, you might be hostile to people because you're expecting hostility in return, and they, sensing that negative energy, will respond negatively to you, will respond to you with hostility, and you, having already had it in your mind that this is because of racism, are probably going to interpret it as racism. It's funny how that works, that whatever you expect to find in the world is usually what you find in the world. And not necessarily because the world is that way in any objective sense, but because you're actually bringing it on yourself. It's what psychologists call a self-fulfilling prophecy. It reminds me of an interview I heard a long time ago with Michelle Obama, where she was saying that, you know, that America is racist, basically. And her evidence for this was that she went into a grocery store once and a white lady asked her to help her get something off of a high shelf. And so in her mind, what this was, was the lady was expecting that because she was black, that meant that she worked in the grocery store. And I suppose Michelle Obama do doesn't think very highly of people who work in grocery stores. So she was offended by this and uh, thought that this was a, a case of racism. And this jumped out at me. It's kind of a silly story, but it jumped out at me because I've had exactly the same experience. I've been in a grocery store and a little old lady asked me to reach something on a shelf that she couldn't reach. And of course, since the lady was white and I was white, I didn't have any opportunity to interpret this as racism. I just figured she wanted me to help her out because I was tall and I could reach the thing that she couldn't reach. And so there's, there's a good chance that that's exactly the same situation with Michelle Obama because she's pretty tall. And of course, I don't know that for sure. Right? Nobody knows that. I'm not in that lady's head, and she wasn't in that lady's head either. So maybe, maybe she really was racist. Maybe she really did think that Michelle Obama worked at the grocery store just because she was black. You know, I can't say that she didn't. But what we have here is, is uh, two situations that are exactly the same, but with completely different interpretations. And these interpretations are completely within our own minds. Right? We, have, we really have no idea what this lady, in, in either case, was thinking. We are just interpreting based on the way that we see the world. And so Michelle Obama lives in a world where she expects racism. And so every innocent gesture of somebody asking for help in a grocery store looks like racism to her. Now, I keep talking about racism, but this really is a lot broader than that. It's anything that we might be insecure about. And there are a lot of different things that people are insecure about, you know? People are insecure that they're too young, that they're too old, that they're too tall, they're too short, they're too fat, they're too skinny. Uh, it's just about anything you could think of, people will have insecurities about. And so it's very easy for somebody to say, yeah, you know, I would like to move out to the country, for example, but I'm afraid that people are going to reject me because I'm black, or I'm afraid that people are going to reject me because I'm an immigrant, or I'm afraid that people are going to reject me because I've always lived in the city and the city is what I know, I'm not one of them, or I'm afraid that people are going to reject me because um, I have long hair and maybe they think I'm a hippie. Um, you know, that you could, you could come up with all of these different reasons for why people might reject you when you get into a new situation. But what I've found is that this is, it's, it's, the insecurity exists independently of the physical characteristics. 
or the personality characteristics or, or whatever you feel insecure about, that if you have insecurity, it will attach itself to something. It will find something to attach itself to. And that might be your race, you know, if you're a racial minority, or it might be your age. You know, I've, I've felt when I started um, teaching courses, especially teaching live courses, I was, I was a little insecure about my age because most of the folks I was teaching were older than me. And then it's kind of funny actually, because I started to notice that all of them felt insecure about their age because they were older. They felt like they're too old. And here I feel like I'm too young. And it's funny because most of us have these insecurities that we don't fit in in some way. But at the same time, everybody else has the same insecurities. We all just attach it to something different. And most of them don't really make any sense at all. I mean, I remember when I was younger, I was, I was insecure because I was like the skinniest kid in my class. Um, I was insecure about how my voice sounded. I was, I was super insecure when I started wearing glasses. That was, I was just mortified to be seen in public wearing glasses. And looking back, it sounds so silly. Like, why would I be uh, insecure about, about something so ridiculous. But the, the truth is that the insecurity exists. It's a spiritual problem. It's something that exists outside of the physical and it just finds something to attach itself to. And so for me at the time, having glasses was the, the thing that it was most salient for it to attach itself to because I associated people with glasses as being nerds, as being the non-cool kids. But if I had just owned it, and, and treated it as like it was something normal, which it is, then I, I would have been totally okay with it. You know, I, probably other people wouldn't have even noticed it if I didn't notice it. One of my business mentors, Myron Golden, puts this really well. He says, people don't see you through their eyes, they see you through your eyes. In other words, people view you the way that you view yourself. The way that you view yourself puts off the energy that, that uh, determines how people see you. And so if you see yourself through a lens of insecurity, you see yourself as that dorky kid with glasses, then guess what? Well, everybody else is going to see you as that dorky kid with glasses. If you see yourself as the weird, creepy immigrant, then other people are going to see you as a weird, creepy immigrant. You get to choose how people see you. On the other hand, if you see yourself as a valuable creation of God who has intrinsic worth and is worth being around and worth spending your time with, then other people will see you in exactly the same light. It's completely your choice. And Myron is black, by the way. This is my mentor that I'm getting this from. Um, so, you know, before somebody says, oh, well, it's easy for you to say because you're white. You know, I'm, I'm getting this from a mentor of mine who is black and who also walks with a limp because he had polio when he was a kid. You know, talk about a reason to, to feel insecure. Um, and he did for, for a long time. He felt terribly insecure and he learned this lesson. He figured out that people respond to him the way that he views himself. And so now, whenever you see him, he's always the biggest man in the room. You know, he's always the, the most respected figure almost anywhere he goes because that's the way he treats himself. He doesn't waste his mental bandwidth on worrying whether somebody is going to be prejudiced against him because he's black or whether somebody is going to laugh at him because he walks with a limp. Right? That's just not something that he thinks about, and as a result, nobody else thinks about it either. And he's become very successful as a public speaker and as a businessman as a result. Now, if you're unique in some way, you're different from most of the people around you in some way, and we all are, by the way, to put in Ayn Rand's words, the smallest minority is the individual, right? We're all different in some way than the people around us, and we can treat that however we want. We can treat that as we're weird and creepy, and we're outcasts from society because we're different in this way, or we can embrace it and enjoy the fact that we're different. We can accept the fact that we're, that we're different. I, I did a video earlier about um, two guys that I knew. Uh, one, one guy who I had just met who was uh, a Brazilian. I met him in Brazil while I was living there, and he had gone to college in the U.S., and after, I think, one semester, he dropped out of college and went back to Brazil because he felt so bad, he felt so awkward being the only Brazilian in the college. Uh, you know, he felt so, so out of place because he was the only, only Brazilian guy that he knew in the college. And it reminded me of a guy that I had known uh, when I went to college, you know, back in the dark ages, a long time ago. Uh, there is a guy who was a Brazilian immigrant. Who, who was in one of my classes, and he was one of the most popular guys in school. 
he eventually became the student body vice president. Like, everybody loved this guy. And it was funny to me because they're both in exactly the same situation, right? They were both Brazilian immigrant in college in the U.S. One of them had faith in himself and believed in himself and used his uniqueness to his advantage, and people responded well to him. The other one was ashamed of his uniqueness, was ashamed of the thing that made him different from the people around him. And so he had such a hard time that he eventually ran away and left. And this is something I understand uh, myself from both sides, having been a foreigner in other countries quite a bit, that being an immigrant can make you either interesting and unique or it can make you creepy, right? These are kind of the two, um, the two ways that people respond to immigrants. Either you're cool and unique and super interesting and, you know, you, the people crowd around you and want to hear your stories of, of your uh, adventures in faraway lands, or they think you're weird and creepy. And I think the main determinant of that is how you see yourself and how you respond to you being the odd man out with the people around you. And in fact, that the word creepy is really interesting to me. Um, I've thought about that a lot because I've been called creepy in the past. Before I learned this lesson that I'm trying to communicate to you here, uh, I've been called creepy. And, and I, I never really understood what that meant. But I think what it is, is creepy is just what you call something that has a negative energy that you can't really define. So if somebody is hostile or violent or angry or he tries to rob you or something like that, you, you, know, you know exactly what it is that's putting you off, or at least you have something physical that you can pin it on. Whereas if somebody is creepy, you're just not sure. You just get a bad vibe from that person. And where that comes from is how you see yourself. If you feel insecure in your own shoes, you feel like you're the odd man out. You feel like you are creepy then you are going to come across as creepy to other people. You're going to give that negative energy that is going to come across as creepy. But it's completely up to you. You can choose whether or not you want to come across as creepy or you want to come across as the coolest guy in the room. It's, it's completely a matter of how you see yourself. And the funny thing is that this works even when there's actual prejudice. Right? Even when there are people who are actually prejudiced against you. Maybe you do go to a rural town and, and there are people that don't particularly like black people or don't particularly like uh, immigrants from your country. If you see yourself in a good light and you are open and friendly and good to everybody around you, nine times out of ten, they'll respond the same way. I mean, there probably are some people in the world that are just so completely full of hate that they, they will respond with hostility to you anyway, but I guarantee you the vast majority will respond nicely even if you are part of some group that they generally have a negative view of. Just because we respond to people's energy. And it's very difficult for us to be nasty to somebody who is being friendly to us. I mean, it just does not come naturally to any of us. And so if you do come across somebody who has some prejudice against you for your race or your nationality or your sex or your fashion sense or whatever it is, and you come across as nice and friendly and have a high energy, then that person will explain that away. They'll say, okay, well, I don't like people from that group normally, but that guy, he's pretty cool. Right? This is just people's natural reaction. This is pe how people naturally behave. And the more that that person uh, is around you, the more they see a counterexample to their normal prejudice, the more their, their prejudice starts to dissipate. Right? Prejudice comes from repeated exposure to, to some pattern, right? That every time I meet a person of a certain physical description, I have a certain result. So, and if a pattern comes out, then the pattern creates the prejudice. And so if you can be the person who breaks that pattern, you're the person that breaks that prejudice. You know, Jesus said to love your enemies and, and bless those who curse you and, and turn the other cheek. You know, this is why. This is why, because that's what turns people's hostility around and makes the world a better place. If you treat, if you fight fire with fire, if you treat people with hostility because they treat you with hostility, well, it just makes more hostility in the world. And it's, it's not helping the other person, it's making them more hostile. It's increasing their prejudice and probably increasing your own prejudice at the same time. So if you're just friendly and good and open to everybody, then one, the vast majority of them will respond 
friendly and good to you, and two, you will be dissipating the negative prejudice that exists in the world. I noticed this a little bit when I've been traveling around, and you know, uh, in 2019, I, I spent most of the year in South America. And I had always heard over and over again that the world hates Americans, that anywhere in the world you go, they hate people from the USA. Um, and while I think it's true that there is a lot of prejudice against Americans, I never let that enter my, my way of being, right? I was always friendly and open with everybody, and everywhere I went, they treated me wonderfully. And I did actually, I saw uh, uh, examples of anti-American prejudice. I would hear people saying about how terrible Americans were when they didn't realize that I was an American. But it, whenever they did know that I was an American, they, they treated me with the utmost respect. So it wasn't that the prejudice wasn't there, it was just that the, the energy is so much more powerful than, than the prejudice is. And if you're a traveler, if you're an American, and you go around the world with this thought in your mind that, oh, everybody hates me because I'm an American, well, you're probably going to encounter a lot of hostility because that's what you are expecting, and so that's what you're projecting into the world, and people will, will respond accordingly. Okay, so what can you actually do about this? You know, how can you improve the way that you are perceived by the people around you? I'm going to give you four practical things that you can do to improve the way that you are received by those around you. Number one is to expect the best. Wherever you go, consciously envision in your mind people responding to you in exactly the way that you would like them to respond to you. And when you start to have negative thoughts, when you start to think, oh, people are going to be racist against me because I'm an, I'm an immigrant or because I'm black or people don't like Americans or, you know, what it is, whatever it is, I'm too skinny, I'm too fat, I'm too tall, I'm too short, whatever, whatever your uh, insecurity latches onto, whenever those negative thoughts arise, redirect them. Whenever you having the, start having these negative visualizations about people rejecting you for whatever reason, redirect them to positive visualizations of people loving you and accepting and even enjoying your uniqueness. That way you will put off a positive energy instead of a negative one. Second thing you can do is try to get rid of the focus on yourself and start focusing on others. Try to, instead of, instead of always being obsessed with how you feel about your insecurities, try to build other people up. Try to think about how you can make somebody else's day a little bit brighter. Instead of focusing on yourself, focus on somebody else. If you are others focused and you are focused on doing good in the world and making other people's lives just a little bit better because they came into contact with you, then everybody's going to love you, right? Everybody's going to love you because of the way you make them feel. And they're not going to care if you're skinny or you're fat or you're black or you're white or you wear glasses or you wear contact lenses. Nobody is going to care at all because they care about the way that you make them feel. The third thing you can do that is very helpful is to observe your insecurities through the eyes of a neutral third party. That is to notice and, and be honest to yourself about what your insecurities are. So if you're insecure about being too young or too old or uh, having sweaty hands. I mean, I, I used to, when I was a teenager, I was very insecure because I had sweaty hands. I was insecure about my voice. I was insecure about all these silly things. And it actually reminds me of a seminar I saw once where the, um, the, the speaker invited it will told some things that he was insecure about and invited everybody in the audience to come share some things that they were insecure about. And it was, it was funny because the things that people were insecure about were things that nobody else would have ever noticed, right? People had the silliest things that they were insecure about. And it, you know, it just goes back to my point that insecurity is something that exists in the spirit and it attaches itself to something physical and it doesn't matter if it makes sense or not. And it doesn't matter if you fix that thing that you were insecure about. Like, let's say that you're a little overweight and you're very insecure about that. Well, if you go and lose that weight, chances are your insecurity is just going to find something new to attach itself to. You're not going to stop being insecure because the insecurity is, is spiritual. I'm not saying that you shouldn't lose weight, by the way. I mean, if you're going to make yourself healthier and more attractive, then absolutely do it. I'm just saying... It's not going to cause, it's, the physical cure is not going to solve a spiritual problem. It will just find some other way of manifesting itself. But if you can start to recognize your insecurities through the eye of a neutral observer, you can start to recognize how ridiculous they are. 
right? You can, you can kind of start to laugh about it. You say, okay, I'm, I'm insecure because I have glasses. Isn't that funny? Isn't, doesn't that make no sense whatsoever? Why would I be insecure because I wear glasses? What, what difference does that make in the way that I can interact with the world? And so if you can do that, then when those insecure thoughts come up, then all of a sudden they, they lose power. Right? They, they, come, they turn from being something that's, that's big and scary and overwhelming to being something that's amusing, that's kind of silly, that's something you can laugh at. And then the last thing that I will advise specifically for the viewer in, in this situation of being worried about racism in the small town is to try it before you buy it. You know, don't, don't go buy a house in a place that you've never been to before. Go stay there for a while. Go on like vrbo.com, get a vacation rental there, stay there for a few days or a week and observe how people respond to you. And if you, if you really want to, and actually I recommend this, try some of the strategies that I mentioned today. In fact, even do an experiment. Go there uh, thinking about how you're, you know, you're afraid of racism or you're afraid of people being hostile or prejudiced against you. See how people respond. And then the next day, go out to maybe a different place and think in positive terms. Think about how you are a great person and everybody is going to love you and you accept yourself because you are a wonderful creation of God. And then see how people respond to you differently. I get that you will notice a big difference. But either way, um, you can give yourself a little bit of peace of mind knowing that you've tested the waters before you jumped in. So I hope you found this helpful. If you have some insecurity that you would like help dealing with, then put it in the comments. Just the fact that you're calling it out, just the fact that you're recognizing it uh, is helpful in and of itself. So go ahead and do that if it'd be helpful for you. Hit the thumbs up because it makes YouTube like me better. Hit the subscribe button and the bell icon beside the subscribe button so you're the first to get all my new videos. Share this video with people who need to hear it. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who are wasting their time and wasting the opportunities in their life being insecure when it is doing them absolutely no benefit. So share this with people who have this problem. And then if you enjoyed this video, I also have a free gift for you. It's called the Eight Daily Habits for Success, Happiness, and Spiritual Fulfillment. I'll put a link in the description where you can get that absolutely free. It's just a little thank you for supporting me on YouTube. And if you enjoyed this video, you might also enjoy this video as well.